Good morning, Shiloh Baptist Church. It's another opportunity for us to teach the Word of God. We are so thankful to be back to be able to bring the Word of God to you. We are coming out of today out of uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. The title is Wisdom and Vindication. And if you look at that particular topic, think about that topic. It begins to give you two particular areas that we can kind of focus on. We can look at godly wisdom and man wisdom. And then the vindication, and if you think about this, when Jesus died on the cross and when Jesus came, look at all the things that God had put into place to save his people. So the vindication, the, the validation of what God has said and promised that he will do. So with that being said, get you some paper, get your Bibles open, uh, commentaries. Uh, we're going to kind of expound on this and also really look deep into these, to the word of God. Because when you start studying the word of God, you begin to understand how God reveals things to you and how he teaches you things. So we're coming out of Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19, and it's wisdom, vindication. Let us pray. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to teach your word, Lord. So we ask that you move in me and allow your perfect work in me, Lord. We thank you for those that are hearing the word, that we shall learn, but we also shall not just be hearers, but apply the word of God. We thank you, and we give you all the honor and praise and glory for your name's sake. Amen. So, Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. Two main characters that we're going to really focus on and look at, and there's other characters that's in there. Uh, one, of them, one of the characters is John the Baptist, the forerunner, as, as you will read that, and then also Jesus. Now, if you take these two and compare them, and, and I use this, and when I use the word comparison, you'll, you'll see how it's done in, in the scriptures, but... John the Baptist was a man that lived in the wilderness. Uh, very odd character. Uh, ate locusts and, and honey, camel hair for his clothes. But watch one thing about him, and we're gonna focus on that a little bit too. It's his identity, his dedication to what God has for him. And then on the other hand, Jesus, who comes to save those that are lost. And he does that in a manner that he teaches people through parables and illustrations, but also teaches them the word of God. And he does it by showing them the healings because as, as human beings, we begin to realize some strengths. Um, and so think about how God planned this out. He said, how are they gonna believe in what I'm doing if I don't show them some things? His promise was that Jesus was coming. Isaiah talked about it. Isaiah also talked about John the Baptist and Malachi. But remember, Jesus came for one reason, is to save us. Those that are here and those that to come and those that were in the past. Okay? So let's do a little history about John the Baptist. Uh, you can write this down. I have some scripture for you to follow. But I, 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 the history of John the Baptist is very interesting and how he lived his life. So John the Baptist was put in the prison by Herod, uh, who divorced his wife and married his dead brother's ex-wife. Now listen to this. John the Baptist was very vocal about this marriage. John the Baptist was in jail and did not get the chance to see the miracles and healings that Jesus, Jesus did. So when he sent his two disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who should we look for another? And that's verse three. Jesus told them to go back and tell John the Baptist about the healing of the blind and the lame. Now, I want you to get this point in here. There's a particular piece in there that says John the Baptist went to jail, to prison. Now, if you go into John chapter 1 and you read that entire uh, chapter, you will begin to see how some of these things, and you say, well, he knew Jesus, but watch this. When Jesus came and was baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit came upon him, you have to remember in that particular time, John served a purpose. He was there to baptize and save. And people came in the wilderness to see John the Baptist, to hear him preach. And if you think about it, who would go in the wilderness 
to hear somebody. It, it, it's tough enough to get people to come in the church in the city. So look at all these criteria. Write that note down. Here's the next thing. John the Baptist was in prison and confined in a jail cell. What would you expect for a man who preached to multitudes in the wilderness and baptized? And now the old cousin, who was John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, was jailed because of a hated directive by Herod. Now, here's a comparison, because you will hear about Elijah, E-L-I-A-S, and then Elijah. Here's a comparison. Elijah was hated by Jezebel and ran for his life and went into the wilderness. 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 and 5. Read that. But I want to point that out, is that he went into the wilderness. Now, look at us today. When we were in quarantine, we were isolated. We were just with our family. Man is not meant to be isolated for a long period of time. But isolation has its own dedication. Isolation has its own strength. When you're isolated, think about this. You have time to spend with God. You have time to build your relationship. You have time to study, and you have time to reflect. Now, think about the reflection you have. Not the negative, but the reflection in your relationship, in your, in your study, in your praying. And look at John the Baptist was in the wilderness. He, he relegated, he loved the wilderness, he loved the isolation. Elijah was in the wilderness, but he was in there because he was forced because Jezebel was getting ready to kill him. Now, isolation brings a, a great deal of relationship, but also brings you to be able to hear God. And I want you to understand that as John the Baptist began to hear God, he was dedicated to what God was going to have him to do, the forerunner, to tell everybody about Jesus. Now, look at this. Now, John the Baptist was confined in jail, but yet still he never seen the miracles of Jesus because he was confined. So when you're confined for something you did not do, then there's injustice. Look at the relationship that we have today. Look at all the injustice that goes on today. I didn't do anything wrong. All I did was speak my mind. So in those times, we still had injustice. And today's time, there's still injustice. So there's nothing new that goes on in this world that God does not have control of. And look how Jesus responded to him. Look at Jesus' compassion and love for John the Baptist as he tells the multitudes about the greatness of John the Baptist. And look at his moral character, his solitude in the wilderness. Now, take the wilderness, take isolation. John the Baptist was isolated because he was dedicated to God. He did not want to be distracted. Hence, when we're going to work daily, when we're doing multiple things, we are totally distracted from our true focus of God. But John the Baptist wanted to be focused on God and his mission. Okay? The mission of Christ. The mission of the gospel. One more point. John representation in the ministry. I want you to look this up. Uh, Psalms 1 and three, and we're going to read that at the end. But I want you to look that up. Write that down. Psalms one and three, and this is the representation of what John was, is, and to come, because that's what he represented. Okay, so let's get into the scripture. I gave you a little history about this, so we're going to break these verses down. So it came, and I'm going to go through uh, chapter eleven. I'm going to start with verses one and go all the way down to nineteen. Some of them are combined, but I just want to give some some understanding of that entire chapter that we're getting ready to read. So it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made a, a, the end of commanding his twelve disciples, and he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. You think about this. Jesus now is on his mission to spread the gospel. Number, verse number two. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent to his disciples. Now, you look at this particular verse, verse number two, it begins to talk about John heard. It is always an implication when you say, I've heard something, but I have not physically seen. I heard the good news. I heard about this. But if you have not physically seen, it is 
definitely a difficult piece. So John said, I'm going to send two of my disciples to tell me what's going on so they can come back and tell me. Now look what he says. This is what I talked about, the compassion that Jesus had for John. He said, and said unto him, art thou he that should come and do and look for another? Now, let me read this again so you can get this. And I'm reading out of uh, New King James Version and the King James Version. And he said, and said unto him, art thou he that should come or do we look for another? Now, pause at that. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. But he didn't know him. And that's some studying you have to do in the background to really understand that. Because here's the isolation conversation for you. I'm in prison. I'm isolated from all the things that my older cousin is doing and teaching me and, and miracles and healings. But I didn't have the advantage to see that. And then here's the other side of it. When are you going to get me out of here, Jesus? I hear about all these things you're doing, and I'm in prison for unrighteousness by somebody who hated me. But I did this for the ministry of God. And we'll see that suffering for the ministry, suffering for the gospel, means that there are sacrifices. And if you remember when Jesus said to the disciples, follow me, take up your cross, that is an awesome calling. But do you know what that means to do that? Look at verse number three. And he said unto him, Art thou he? Sorry, verse number four. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and shoot John again those things which he heard and see. Now, you combine those two verses and you understand that he looks at, I hear it, but now I'm going to go back and tell those two disciples that we talked about. And then in verse number five, he talks about what he does. In verse number five, he says, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You always remember that Jesus always refers back to the least of them. And if he preaches to the poor, understand that his heart is for them, because they struggle, they're always downtrodden, they're always pushed down. But look what he says, I'm giving you the insight of what I've done so that you can go back and tell John what I've done. He may not be able to see it, but I'm going to tell him what I've done. Now, look at this. Think about this. Do you receive Jesus giving unto you and the acceptance is a key place for you in the kingdom? So when the word of God is preached to you, when the word of God is given to you, and we'll put two dynamics, we'll have saved folks and unsaved folks. Do you receive the word of God that's given unto you? And as you receive the word of God, what do you do with it? Do you spend time studying the word of God? Or do you just do it on Sundays? Think about that. Isolation. Independence. And separation. So if you separate it from distractions from this world, how much time do you spend with God now that you don't have all these distractions? And having to run so much. Think about what God does for you. Now in verse 6, he says this, and it's such an awesome verse. He said, and, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, if you think about that, receive what I've given to you and don't take offense to it. Hence, Christians on the right-hand side, unsaved folks on the left-hand side. Jesus came to preach to the lost. The disciples came to preach and teach the word of God, the gospel to the lost. Now, with that being said, how do you get them to turn and to receive the word of God in the sense that God wants them to get? It takes time. Look at the, the 12, three years of teaching. They made mistakes. So don't think you're going to make mistakes either. But God has you held up. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is a key point to crossing over and coming to Christ. Verse number seven gets into our verses. Listen how Jesus uses these two analogies, and I gave you the summary in the beginning. He uses this in verse number seven. He said, and they departed. Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what when ye ought out into the wilderness to see 
a reed shaken with the wind. Now, when you read that and you, and you kind of look at that, that wording, what did you go see? Who did you come to see? And, and listen to this. Jesus is vindicating and the love that he has for John the Baptist. Wouldn't you want to have Jesus as your representative if you were in front of a court and he was your lawyer and he testified on your behalf as the character witness how awesome it would be? And this is what Jesus is doing for John. Watch what he says. He gives you this awesome analogy. And if you ever go into a field and, and see those little reeds, as the wind blows, it whistles. And that's what he said. John the Baptist is not a person that goes to and fro as the wind goes. He is steadfast. His foundation is secure. But God is good in what he does. Because you think about this multitude, they're questioning John's relationship. They're questioning who John is. And Jesus is saying, no, this is not who he is. Remember, he was preaching to multitudes in the wilderness. They came to see him in the wilderness to talk about God, to repent and be saved. But now we question him. Look at verse number eight says, but what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that were soft clothing are in king's houses. He uses another analogy. And if you go back into the Middle East, into the, that history time, anybody that wore fine clothing were in the king's palace. John was none of that. Camel hair, locusts and honey lived in the wilderness. So let's look at a bias. Today we have biases. We look at how people look on the outside. And so this generation and, and, and the generation in the past and this particular history, they're looking at what he was, his external appearance. Now, if he was in fine clothing, rich, oh, they would flock to him. But he was none of those things. And Jesus was none of those things either. Think about that. Look at how the biases extremely depicts John the Baptist, who wore camel hair and ate locusts and honey. We have the same biases today. And these biases dictate how we look at people. If someone came into church in raggedy clothes, how would we, would we receive them? Our own biases dictate how we deal with people. We have to be careful, but we need help from God to help us to be a better, have a better understanding. Some days our, our, our biases overwhelm us and changes how we see. If our prophets and Jesus had to deal with them, what do you expect? So imagine Jesus in that particular time talking to the multitudes and giving them a conversation. And they're questioning him about John the Baptist's character and moral. What would you say if you were not Jesus? And that was depicted for you. How would you look at a person that did not look the way we expect him to look? Today's biases. Let's look at the change of the nature of humans. And I want you to write these words down. Very, very strong words. Intrinsic. I-N-T-R-I-S-I-C. -I and it says, belonging naturally. It's within you. Ingrained, another word. Belief, attitude, and firmly fixed. And here's the beautiful word that we all think about in our lives. God said, be rooted in his word. But look at this, rooted. That means it is established deeply. How do you change the way someone thinks and you have the living Savior in front of you? telling you about the character of John the Baptist. And he said, do they look like this? Because their representation of John the Baptist is this way, but John the Baptist is about God's ministry. Are you about God's ministry? Think about that. Will you sacrifice? John the Baptist was selfless. He put everything behind and put God's ministry first. Look at verse number eight. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea. 
And this is, how, this is how Jesus is having this conversation back and forth with the multitudes trying to tell them. He is a prophet, a good moral character prophet. I say it to you, and more than a prophet. Now he's giving you an example of what kind of man John the Baptist is. Now, in the beginning I told you about he went to prison. And he went to prison because he was very vocal about what Harold did in marrying his dead brother, ex-wife. Think about that. In those times, he could have been dead immediately. But he trusted God. He stood on the moral characters of what God gave to him. Now, if you think about that, what does God do for us today? He protects us. Grace and mercy, salvation, Holy Spirit, cover. Think about that. As God continues to teach us where we need to be. Let's look at the next part, verse number 10. For, for this is he on whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before me. Now, we, we think about that. God prepared a way for who? John the Baptist was prepared for his ministry. Is our ministry a key point for our success? Because think about it. As disciples of Christ, we are to bring others into Christ. We are to bring those that are lost into Christ. And then here's the next part. How do you keep them? Do we depict them based on how they look? Do we depict them based on their level of, of their Christianity, their immaturity? Or do we continue to feed them as Jesus continued to feed his disciples and watch them grow? There was a lot of things that they questioned Jesus about with John the Baptist. But John stood for God. He stood for his ministry. He believed in his ministry. I want you to write this scripture down, Malachi 3 and 1. And we'll try to get back to these scriptures. Here's the next one. And understand how God teaches us. Here's the next part. John the Baptist was a moral character, godly. His evidence of his ministry and spreading the gospel. There is no prophet like him, born of a woman. Verse 11 describes how God depicts and tells them about. Look at him. One thing about him. He said, very good, I say unto you. Among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That is an awesome representation of what God has given and has stated for him. He's making a case. But then if you look at the latter part of it, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now watch this. When you look at that, and you spend time studying that, you... Jesus always refers back to the least of them, the poor, the less, the downtrodden. And look how he looks at that, the downtrodden. Verse number 12, and he says that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violence take it by force. Now, You think about the kingdom of God and you think about in those times when they had to struggle and they had to fight and their lives were always threatened. Everything that they did, they had threats upon their life. Today we don't have any threats upon our life to spread the word of God. It is freely given and freely received. But no one is threatening you about teaching, preaching, and spreading the word of God. But in those days, that was one of the things that they had to deal with. And if the king was not happy with you and what you did, you would be next. Look at the next part. Verse number 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So we can go back and look at Elijah, Malachi, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Talks about the forerunner. Talks about him. In Malachi 3 and 1. It talks about him being the forerunner. It talks about him coming to tell the world about the Messiah coming. Preparing a place for him. 
And if you look at how good God is, he is linear in everything that he does. He started from Genesis all the way to now. And think about his plan. Destroying the world by water. Then multiplying it by Noah's family. And then again, man went back to their nature again. And think how God was thinking, I have to bring something greater in here. Because apparently man is not getting what I'm telling them. And I bring the greatest thing that I could ever bring is my son to save. And John the Baptist was just awesome in telling you the story about Jesus. Now, 15 is a key point. I want you to kind of circle this one because this is for all of us. It is very clear that we do this today. He said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So here's one of my notes. Take into account of what God is saying through his prophets and adhere to his words and retain the gospel for life application. Retaining means that you have to spend time with God. Now remember we're in isolation and we have a little freedom to go to the store and go here and go to work and come home. But while we were in isolation, our relationship with God should have been built. And I said the word should have. Because it takes time. And God is patient and loving. Look at all the things that he does for us. His prophets were here to save us and to help us. Watch this. And teach us so that when Jesus came, look what the awesome things. Everybody said, oh, look at what God has done. He has brought his Savior. His promises are true. Look at our nature. He's here, and we still question. We still deny him, but he still loved us. Write this word down, and I want you to kind of look at this, because sometimes we, we forget this in our hearts, and, and sometimes we don't do it purposely or intentionally, and the word is motives. And when I read these couple of verses, you, you kind of see how these Pharisees have motives, and he uses this word generation in their particular time and in our time. How do we depict things that's in our generation in their time and today's time? Look what he says in verse number 16. But where unto, where unto you shall I liken this generation? It is like unto the children sitting in the market and calling unto the fellows. And verse 17 says, and saying, we have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. Now, he uses the example of the market in those times, kids sitting around and calling their friends. And today we can say calling your friends if you go to the mall. But look what they said. We played music for you. You didn't dance. We mourn for you. And the word lament, we didn't cry. So your motives, as I said, having the right intentions. And so the Pharisees did not have the right intentions. But look what he says, intentionally doing the right thing, intentionally doing the right thing, your intentions should be led by what God has given them to you. Now, it takes time, it takes relationship, it takes the word of God, it takes the Holy Spirit to move. You have Jesus giving the account and the character of John the Baptist to these multitudes that are questioning him. But yet still, John lived his life and his life was lived by his walk. Not by his talk, but by his walk. So we can use him as an example. I'm motivated by the prophets. I'm motivated by the greatest servant, which is Jesus. He is the greatest character witness for John the Baptist and for us. He knows our hearts. Even though when people are destroying us, he knows our hearts and he knows what we can bear. Look at verse 18 and 19. He said, but John, for John came near, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. Isn't that something? John was in the wilderness, isolated from people. People came to hear him preach. And yet, and still, people are still characterizing him and assassinating his character. 
And then what they, look what they said about, our, about Jesus. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Behold, a man of gluttonous and wine bibber, a friend of the publicans and sinners. And then I love when Jesus says this. And one day we're going to be able to get this, be able to say that stuff. And I, I'm hoping I can get there one day. But wisdom is justified, justified on her children. What an imparting word to hear a, a word of comfort and not a word of anger for people coming after you. So let's look at this comparison. And then I'm going to try to read a couple of scriptures. So John the Baptist was confronted. He was comfortable in the wilderness. He was isolated from all distractions of life. And he focused on his task. And his task was for them to repent and to be baptized and to be saved. Now let's look at Jesus' task. Now, John was in the wilderness. Jesus was amongst the sinners and the publicans. And people still criticized the Pharisees and the scribes. But look at Jesus. Jesus was equipped to go out here and deal with them, correct? There was nothing about Jesus that he could not handle. Jesus' task was to save the unsaved and spread the gospel. So he dealt with those with struggles, bringing them out of bondage. So you never know that you are in bondage when you are in sin because you don't understand. But though they had crossed over and came into the righteousness and being saved by God's grace, understand the bondage that they were in because God begins to reveal the truth. So let's look at your motivation. What are you motivated by? So you provide a reason to act a certain way. John the Baptist had a reason to act because God had embedded that, fulfilled him, had given unto him. And with that being said, you go to this other place. Because now he's moving in his heart, his spirit, and he says now the desire to act in service of a particular goal. And his goal was the ministry of God. You have the greatest witness, which is Jesus. And John the Baptist was an example of God-inspired prophet. Sometimes you have to go in the wilderness to hear God. And receive your instructions for your next journey. So where's your next journey at? How do you supply your journey that God has given unto you? What has God done for you? And you got to pause and think about that. The wilderness experience is almost one of the most awesomest understandings that you can have. Because when you by yourself, you can hear God. You can hear God. So I want you to write these things down and look at some of these scriptures. Matthew 5, 1 and 20. And focus on Matthew uh, 5 and 16. Because when we think about what God has done for us, look at the love that he has provided for us and taught us in our lives. And it's very familiar passage, the Beatitudes, but it's such a, a, a particular piece that teaches us, and this is John the Baptist. So it's Matthew chapter five, verse 16. Listen to this. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you look at that particular piece, that represents John the Baptist, that represents Jesus and all the prophets. Let your light so shine before men. So you don't have to tell people about what you do. You don't have to speak about it. Your works is the example. And John the Baptist's works was the example. Shine before men. Almost one of the things that you think about. Am I living in vain? Have I done all the things that God has required me to do? No, 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 no. Because we're not capable of doing any of this by ourselves. We have to begin to understand that John was selfless. John believed what God was doing for him. 
John believed that. You have to believe in your ministry. You have to believe in your walk. You have to be motivated in your walk. And your motivation has to be greater than you. And if you don't understand that, then you have to spend some time with Christ. Here's the last part of peace I want to give to you. Go to Psalms. Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scorn. Sometimes we've been there. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he med meditate, excuse me, meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water, rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also, also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That is Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Think about that. And look at those two verses, how God is moving for what God has done for you. So I thank you for this opportunity to teach and the application that God has given unto us to be able to apply. And as you spend time this week, understand that God is always there. So I thank you. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to teach. But thank you for using me, Lord. And thank you for those that have heard the word. And thank you for uplifting. Lord, and this thank you because you're such an awesome God. We thank you and give you all the honor and praise of the Lord for your name's sake. Amen.